welcome to Dark Dreams. I say every house in America should have an electric chair. And every man just once in his life should sit in it. Just so that he can feel the power of millions of gallons of electricity flow through his veins. I got an electric chair, that's all I need. You get an electric chair, Sheldon, you don't have to worry about the audience. You get an electric chair, you can tell them anything you want. As long as it's real. You get yourself an electric chair and I'll sit there all night long. Kind of a funny idea, sitting in an electric chair and doing a show. Well, think of the therapeutic value of an electric chair and all the money it is. Yes, sir. An electric chair in every home. The Electric Chair. A show about horror. Electricchairshow.com Electric Chair. Wow. Graven Image by David North Martino Our clients all have a peculiar fear. They're not convinced their loved ones will stay dead the director of Sanguine Mortuary said. Hatch fought for control. He thought he might go from smirk to grin to all-out laughter. The director, his face as dead as any of the clients entombed in Sanguine's walls, stared at Hatch from behind an expensive-looking oak desk. The dire need for the job forced Hatch's expression to the same state as the director's name. Mr. Stone, I... Jonathan. I know what I'm telling you might be hard to accept, but we provide a valuable service to our clientele. Stone wrinkled his face into the best mortician's smile. Mr. Stone, Hatch said, I really need this job. Whether I believe or not, I can watch your building and everything in it. You seem like a good fellow. Pity. Companies will throw away employees after a decade of service. Mr. Stone gently placed Hatch's resume on the desk. I'll give you a chance. Just keep your wanderlust to a minimum. The last guard couldn't contain his curiosity. If he hadn't up and disappeared, I would have had to fire him. Elation. At this point, any job was a good job. He made a mental note to pick up a bottle of wine on the way home. He and his wife would at last have something to celebrate. But behind the euphoria and relief, something nagged at him. Later, when he gave it some thought, after half a bottle of wine and with his wife in a satisfied sleep beside him, questions arose, questions he couldn't answer, and they chattered through his mind, lulling him into a troubled sleep. Uh, what's on the monitors? Hatch asked. The surreal images were better than caffeine. No way he could drift off with those things staring at him. Those? Oh, go on, take a good look, Michael Evans, the second shift sergeant said. What do they look like to you? Looks like dead people. Those are our charges. Three hundred and thirty-eight of them. Evans seemed proud with the knowledge. Oh, you don't worry. They ain't going to bother you much or entertain you for that matter. Then why are we monitoring them? Just in case they wake up, Evans said. Hatch felt a chill shoot into his groin. Soon he would be here alone, alone with them. Then Evans broke into a fit of heaving laughter. Nah, <laughs> they ain't gonna wake up. I've been working here for five years since I retired from the military. I ain't never seen a one so much as wrinkle a nose. Hatch stared at the monitors again. See, we have some very superstitious rich people around the world, and Sanguine helps alleviate their fear and a good amount of their cash. Evans shook his head back and forth in mock disbelief. Gotta show the client something, right? Show the client that our security types are watching their loved ones 24 by 7. Kind of makes me chuckle. But it's a good gig, especially on the off shifts. We don't get no visitors, grieving family members, or anything like that. We let the dead lay play a little poker. You'll have to play solitaire. And walk around a couple times. Make sure things are safe and secure. For the world outside, I guess. 
He laughed again, as if the whole thing were ludicrous. Evans showed Hatch around for the rest of the hour. He saved one piece of trivia for last. This is what I call the bat phone, Evans said, and Hatch understood why. The phone looked like an old model from the 1960s, rotary dial and all, and it was colored red like on the TV show. In the unlikely chance that something unusual happens, you pick up this phone and, well, after that I don't know, but I'm sure you won't find out. Damn thing probably don't even have service. Evans had a pitying look on his face, like he was about to leave his favorite cat at the vet to be euthanized. Hatch wondered if he could handle staying at Sanguine Mortuary alone for fifteen minutes, never mind eight hours. What happened to the last officer who worked the third shift? Harold Drendel? Shoot. He'd worked here long as I did. We used to talk a little at shift change, and he confessed to me he was having marital problems. Problems caused by money. Which, by the way, is how they always start. And then one day, I guess he was sick of it. He up and abandoned post some time before shift change, and he hasn't been seen since. He told me in confidence he was planning to go to Hawaii. Had been socking away a little here and there. So don't you be letting your mind wander and go thinking nonsense. You'll get used to this place soon enough. Hatch shook his head. Maybe when he got back to the command center, he would fix the typo. Hatch flicked on the lights. The antiseptic, non-denominational room radiated comfort, as if something from beyond could reach out and protect all those who entered. A feral cat's mew, a crying child, a vocalized rush of wind raging through the hall toward him. Hatch crossed the threshold, pulled at the cherrywood door, and held it shut. The chapel shook, and the doors threatened to pull from his grasp. Then the pounding, shrill scream stopped, and Hatch stood in silence. "'Damn trains,' Hatch said. Then he remembered he was standing in a chapel. He looked up. "'Sorry.' Hatch continued with the tour. He came to a short stairwell that led down to the basement level. Cautiously, he descended. Hatch switched on the flashlight and adjusted the beam to full width. The key point waited at the end of the hall, surrounded by darkness. Hatch felt around for a light switch, but found nothing. His pulse pounded in his temples. Making quick time, he passed closed doors on either side of the hall. He touched the tour reader to the key and waited impatiently for the chirp. A red door on his right caught his attention. He tried the handle. Locked. He glanced back toward the stairs, then back to the door. His curiosity got the better of him, and he tried his keys until one fit the lock. He stepped inside a room filled with black metal file cabinets. The beam of light illuminated a unique cabinet, a red cabinet. He found a jagged hole where the lock should have been, as if someone had cut the mechanism out of the frame. Hatch opened the top drawer and rifled through musty folders and yellowed papers. Most seemed to be nothing more than death records. Every soul buried at Sanguine must have been stored in that room. But then he found something else. A letter, age-stained and water-marked, written on parchment with what appeared to be a quill pen ignited Hatch's curiosity. His eyes widened as he scanned strange sections. Thank you again for taking this burden from me. I am getting much too old to act as custodian any longer. The families absolutely insist on having guards. I know it sounds ridiculous, as if flesh and blood could really protect anyone from what is now in your possession. Feeding time is distasteful, but it lasts a relatively short time. I was lucky to only witness it for two full cycles in the twenty years since I acquired the collection. The dead must feed before they sleep. The dead must feed? What the hell did that mean? A booming, metallic reverberation made him jump. The sound had come from the hall. His mouth went dry and his throat tightened, but he had to check it out. That's what he was being paid for. Hatch cautiously stepped out into the hall. The reflection of his flashlight beam caught movement through a window in one of the doors. Anybody home? Hatch inched closer and shone the light inside, recoiled. A man stood, 
if that's what you could call the thing that stood before him, dressed in a moth-eaten suit, bending over what looked like a metal cadaver table, and the terrible thing that looked like a man chomped and smacked his lips as he devoured what remained of a body on the table. The head and chest were all that remained of the corpse on the table. Everything else had been consumed. Hatch hacked and heaved, but nothing came up, as if his insides had turned to dust. He looked back at the window. The ghoul turned its head and looked at him, still stuffing flesh in between the stitches that held his lips together. The ghoul grinned at him. Then came the screams. Hatch raced through the halls double time, the shrieks of the dead nipping at his ears. Which way out? He couldn't remember. He passed the chapel. Sanctuary wouldn't do. He needed the command center. He needed the phone. He slammed shut the command center door. No lock. The irony sent him into hysterics. Hatch turned around. The monitors were still trained on the coffins. Some were empty. The cadavers that remained opened their eyes. Shit! Hatch reached for the phone, hesitated, picked it up. The phone automatically dialed. The ring scratched in his left ear. The dead wailed in his right. Pick up, damn it, pick up! The ringing stopped. A moment of hesitation. I told you to curb your curiosity, Jonathan. The door buckled. Glass shattered. All went black. Even with his eyes closed, Hatch could sense that Sergeant Evans stared at him, stared at the monitors. Curiosity could be a terrible thing. Recognition, worse. The high-pitched chatter from the others Hatch only heard in a sanguine whisper, but he could understand what they wanted, what he also wanted, one last time before the sleep. The hunger rose in him, in them, and in unison, and to the terror of Michael Evans, they all opened their eyes. The thread of life is getting extremely thin, my dear sisters. Humanity's tapestry is once again becoming threadbare. If we do not find a way to help them soon, I'm afraid they may all die. We will have to descend down into the underworld once again until humanity has regained their balance. Verdandi, no! I don't want to go to the underworld again. It stinks there. We must weave their fate stronger. They must survive. Can you whisper to the humans of their fate? If I am to go into the underworld, they are to come with me. There are powerful female humans down there who interlace the future of many. I have seen it cut in their poles of destiny. Many humans deserve to have their threads cut off. Perhaps another purge is what they need in order to come together once again. My sister's word. The past has proven itself. Humans will continue to find ways to destroy themselves. I have seen it in the present. Many humans are trying to protect one another, but power, greed, and hate consumes them. It is ruining our beautiful tapestry. I also do not particularly care for the smell of the underworld. Then what do you suggest, Verdandi? What is one of the things which unites humans the most? A great disaster. Yes, yes, this is truth that you speak. Humans always come to the aid of others when a catastrophe strikes. They send aid from all over the world to help one another. That is exactly what we need. But would that be enough to save them? And keep us from descent into the underworld? Hmm, an excellent question, my sweet little sister. I believe the three of us together could create incredible apocalyptic situations for our female humans. For it is with them the power to survive and to continue their species. In the past, we have provided them with plagues, floods, and witch hunts. Those were nice. What could we throw at them now to help join healing energies and find themselves once again? Weird, we can't kill them all. Otherwise, we'll have to wait for another evolution. Of course not, dearest Skald. We wouldn't want to sabotage their precious future. Cull out the impuissance, I say. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Why don't we let the wickeds decide for us? They'll know how to handle this. Yes. Yes. We can give them the precious yarns of life to weave humanity's horror story. They can decide their own fate. That's a superb idea. I think we'll need to provide them with a few helpful suggestions to ensure their survival. I like it. What a delicious way to create chaos. The winning disaster will be their ultimate demise. Or their ultimate survival. Each woman has the ability to influence her fate based on what she's experienced in the past. Scald, you are too much of an optimist for me. I hate the smell of rotting snails that the underworld offers. I'm not going back. I'm ready to cut their threads and end their lives. Get rid of the weak ones, I say. Verdandi, how do we find these powerful wicked women to craft a tale of survival in an impossible situation to help fortify the tapestry of their existence? It's quite simple, really. All they have to do is email to www.challenge2013 at gmail.com. And in the body of the email, they can include their name, a short bio of themselves, and a headshot in order to enter the challenge. I'm in a hurry. When do they need to send this in? I don't want to step one foot into the underworld if I don't have to. The smell, it's just, oh, I don't even want to think about it. Oh, we have time, my sisters, but the sooner our wicked women writers submit, the longer they'll have to craft their tales of doom. Official cutoff date for submissions is June 20th. Voters shall decide their fates by October 19th, and we will have our 2013 Most Wicked Woman Writer. She, and only she, will determine how the world brings upon its own apocalypse. And right before All Hallows' Eve, too. How very fitting. Let's make this unusually interesting, shall we? I say we provide the entrance, the disaster, and an inconvenient location. And at least one item to help them out in their horrific situation. We must give them a fighting chance. Indeed. Compelling. Hmm. What if we give them an untimely disability? Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Life is never convenient. Why should the apocalypse be any different? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. By, by, by the, the blood, blood of, of we, we three, we. let that release the fears that, that be. be. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, in order to choose Earth's ultimate demise and to bring the hearts of humanity together once again in peace and love. We need you to send us your name, short bio, and a headshot to www.challenge2013 at gmail.com. Please put 2013 How Will You Survive entrant in the subject line. Then, once we have all of our victims... Um, you mean entrants? <laughs> yes, right. Entrance, I mean. <clears throat> we will roll the runes to decide who gets what apocalyptic disaster, location, their helpful item, and... Their untimely disability. <laughs> Hurry now. Those who enter will receive their roll of the runes. Then, and only then, will be revealed their apocalyptic situation. Those who dare enter early will have the most time to craft their story. Take care, and good luck. Please survive. We really do not wish to go back down into the underworld. Nothing kills the smell. Who shall be the most wicked 2013? My Dog, a story by Mark Slade. I have a new dog named Charlie. I found him wandering the streets looking slightly disoriented and frail. I took him back to my basement apartment. For a week, I have taken good care of him. Sometimes, Charlie is a very bad dog, always trying to run away, making noise at night. I keep him in a cage as punishment and for his own protection. I have to keep him a secret. My landlady doesn't allow pets. The other day, the woman next door knocked on my door. 
I'm looking for my husband, Charlie. He went out for cigarettes and is now missing. Have you seen him? I told her I hadn't seen him. I shut my door, looked at Charlie. He was whimpering, cowering in the corner of the cage. His naked body, broken and bruised. She's not getting you back, I told him. Death Comes a Knocking, a story by Mark Slade. Here in my bed, I await death. I am a sick old man. I have lived a long and prosperous life, as good as I could be, and as bad as I could be. I helped the poor when I was barely scraping by myself, learning the law to help the suffering and make sure the innocent was not persecuted. And when I passed the bar, I joined a big law firm. I defended the innocent in my early days, and I always lost. So I started defending the guilty. After that, I rarely lost a case. Soon, I was the Venero's family lawyer. I ended up starting a big law firm with another lawyer. I stole my partner's wife. He committed suicide, and I became the sole owner of the firm. I raised two children, a boy and a girl. My son has left the family, never to stay in touch. I have no way of knowing if he is alive, dead, or has a family of his own. My daughter has lived with me after bearing two husbands, one dying of acute alcoholism, the other in an unnamed war halfway across the globe. My daughter is good to me, even after I am horrible to her. She still worships the ground I stand on. Wait, what is that scratching at my window? It is death. I know it. He is scratching on the glass with his long, bony finger. I see his red eyes staring at me from the cold, dark night. I hear him hissing. My bedroom door creaks open. I scream, back, you fiend. Back to the land of the dead. You will never take me with you. It is only my daughter to bring me my tea and supper. She is good to me. I smile at her. So very glad she is here with me. I tell her that. She laughs. She sets the silver tray in front of me. I welcome the tray containing my plate of scrambled eggs and tea with much excitement. I pat my daughter's hand. She smiles at me, says she loves me. In mere moments, I feel her hand growing colder, ice cold. I look down and see it no longer has warm peach skin upon it. It is now a long, bone white hand. I look up at my daughter. She is still smiling endearingly, those horrible red eyes staring me down. Thank you.